In this lecture, we're going to discuss the handheld portable plunge router. So the portable electric router is a precision power tool with a wide range of applications. Once it's properly set up, the router facilitates the fast and accurate production of intricate joints, decorative cuts and shaped edges. It can be used freehand or with the aids of guides and jigs. Routers vary in size and power depending on the types of operations for which they are designed. And broadly, and, and particularly in the school context, there are three main sizes of portable electric routers that are available. The smallest are known as trim routers, and they are useful for fine work and edge trimming. In the secondary school context, these are often the best type of router to introduce this, um, to the students. So let's have a look at the three main kinds. So you can see over on the left there is a small trim router. Um, and like I said, they're a very good uh, tool to introduce to students. Normally in the school context, it's around about year nine. It depends on what state you're in. Um, but certainly uh, in New South Wales, uh, it's year nine that they're allowed to use it. Um, so the small trim router usually has a six millimeter or a quarter inch chuck. It's about 440 watts upwards. You can see that particular one there is a 710 watt one. They will rotate at around about 28,000 RPM, which is pretty quick. They've got a fixed base uh, and see through, or in this case, it's like you've got a fairly large opening there so you can see into it. The medium sized router, and I've got a Makita 900 watt plunge router there. Again, they're, they're fairly common in schools. They can come with a six or a 12 millimeter chuck or a quarter or a half inch. They're usually, you know, somewhere around about a thousand watts. That particular one is a 900 watt motor up to around about 24,000 RPM. They can have a fixed base, but the better ones will have a plunge base on it, which means that you can um, do plunge routing um, processes. The better ones, not all of them, will have an electronic soft start um, and also some constant torque electronics. Um, and also some will have a variable speed. A lot of them will have a dust extraction or dust collection port on it, so you can plug a, a vacuum into it. Now the one over on the right there, that's a that's a large 2400 watt router. Just with the scaling of the image there, it's, it's actually bigger in real life in relation to the other routers. It's a big, quite a heavy and powerful router. And so that particular one does have an electronic soft start on it, which is a good thing to have because when you start a router, there is just that little bit of kick um, from the torque as the motor um, goes up to speed. And obviously on the little trim routers, that can be, you know, easily managed. But um, on the bigger routers, uh, it, there can be a bit of weight behind it. And in all cases, those, the large routers, they'll have a 12 millimeter or a half inch chuck on them. Okay, and, and we probably talked through this just a little bit already. So many newer routers have a variable speed control, which can vary the speed between, you know, around about 8,000 up to 18,000 RPM and holds the cutting speed steady while the cut is being taken. Now, the advantage of a variable speed router is, um, and there's a little bit of maths in this, but if you imagine the bigger the diameter of the bit, you want to start to slow the... Um, the speed rate, like the uh, rotational rate down, um, because obviously the larger the diameter the, the router, um, that outside speed of the diameter gets quite high. So you might need to slow it down. Um, and then the, the plunge router allows the cutter to be lowered into the timber for a plunge type cut. This becomes useful where a cut needs to be started in the middle of a piece of timber. Um, whereas a fixed base machine must be tilted to ease the bit into the cut, which can result in a loss of control and is generally considered to be unsafe in the school context. 
Um, now, I've put a, a standard operating procedure there for a portable plunge router, and that's a school, like a school context um, one there. So you can see what sorts of information um, is on that. One thing I did note, that one doesn't specifically speak about hearing protection, um, but as I mentioned over here, they do create quite a bit of noise. So I would uh, generally recommend hearing protection. So from a safety perspective, we need to understand that the base of the router is quite open because it's necessary to see where a cut may start and finish. Um, and this means that the user's face can be quite close to the machine and the rotating cutter. They're also one of the noisiest machines in the workshop, as I just mentioned, to the extent that if unprotected, the user and others nearby can experience hearing damage. So we're, we're wear earmuffs. They also do throw up a fair bit of dust and sometimes wood chips. Um, so when using a router, the user must be wearing appropriate PPE for the face, eyes, and also the breathing. And it depends on what you have as in terms of facilities in your school, but wherever possible, the router should be connected to dust, dust extraction. Now feed direction, this is really important. It can be a bit difficult to explain to students. So sometimes I think visually is the way to go. So when you look at a router from above, the cutter on the router always rotates in a clockwise direction. Um, the router should be fed into the workpiece in the same direction as the rotation of the cutter. So you can see it there, the, the, the cutter is is spinning in a clockwise direction and it's um, in terms of how it's hitting the timber it's hitting it from the left to the right and that's the same with the feed direction we should move the feed from the left to the right the other thing too is the router will also pull to the side um, and again it just depends on you know where it's actually connecting with the timber um, and obviously in this case in the case of the image there it, you can see it's at the front of the cutter. So what it's going to do, it's also going to pull upwards towards the top of the top of the screen. So if you're using a fence or a guide, this will have implications for what side of the router the fence will be attached to. So in this case, you would have the fence attached to the bottom if the fence was actually screwed onto the router. If the fence was clamped onto the workpiece, you would actually have it above. And if you can't um, work out, you know, what I'm saying there, bring it up in the tutorial and we'll discuss it. Another good rule of thumb to remember is when routing around the outside of a workpiece, the router will travel or should be um, fed in an anti-clockwise direction. And for exactly the same reasons as discussed above. But say if you've got a frame, like a you know a, a window frame, and or you're putting a housing in there for the glass. Um, so when you're routing around the inside, it will go in a clockwise direction, but for exactly the same reasons as we've already dis discussed. Okay, now let's just talk about climb cutting. Generally, if you sort of you know look at video tutorials on YouTube or read books or whatever. You will see woodworkers talking about climb cutting. And that's where you feed the router in the opposite direction to what we just discussed. And from a woodworking perspective, there are good reasons for this. Climb cutting can give you a cleaner finish and can reduce burning, particularly on end grain. And just a little tip, if you're ever using a, a CNC router, um, you will have some settings there. It's generally best to set it so it does climb cut. Now, but this is where the confusion comes. This is an advanced technique and should not be done with school students. By feeding the workpiece in the opposite direction of the cutter rotation, the cutter can grab and push the router harder in the same direction because you're already pushing the router in, the, in that direction. So in this case, you're working with each other and you don't want that. Um, so inexperienced hands, 
sorry, in inexperienced hands, it can be easy to lose control of the router. For this reason, that it should not be taught um, or practiced with school students. All right, so the chuck, and this is about how do we how do we change router bits? So routers use a collet which grabs onto the shank of the router bit. Um, when the collet nut is tightened, so you can see the images over there, the collet nut or, or the chuck, um, the diameter, um, sorry, um, yeah, so it grips onto the shank of the router bit when the collet nut is tightened. The diameter of the shank of a router bit can vary. It is important to confirm that the correct diameter shank is matched to the correct collet. And you can see there's some different sized collets there. Now, in Australia, 6mm shanks and 12mm shanks are the most common. However, it is important to check as imperial shanks are slightly different in dimension. And if matched to an incorrect collet, it is possible for the cutter to work loose. Normally, if you're buying um, the router, you will have it set up with the appropriate collet for Australian conditions. Now, there's two main types of collet chucks for the router, the split and the fingered collet. Um, and you can see the ones that are pictured there are fingered collets. Now, the fingered collet is more expensive and a little bit more prone to damage. They're a little bit more delicate, but it does provide more holding power. Okay, so when we set up the router for use, the following steps should be taken. And this is, I mean, this just has to become habit. Ensure the router is disconnected from the power supply. And to be honest, um, I prefer to actually pull the plug out. I want to have visual confirmation that the router is not connected. Um, I'm not going to rely on the on-off switch. I want to know 100% that there is no power going to that router. Because when you're changing router bits, you've got your hands right around the cutter at all times. So you select the appropriate cutting bit and insert it into the collet until it touches the spindle. So it, it kind of bottoms out. Lightly tighten the collet nut and be, before it is too tight, pull the cutter out two millimeters so that it is no longer bottoming out on the spindle. And you can see in the adjacent image there, there's a little bit of a, a um, gap there between the shank and, and the spindle. Now tighten the collet nut so that the cutter is firmly held and, and very firmly held. The depth of the cut can now be set by adjusting the, the base plate. And once you've done that, lock the base plate firmly. Okay, so you've set the router up, and so now you're going to be um, conducting whatever cut it is that you want to do. And so now we want to talk about guiding the router. And there's five main ways you can guide a router. So the first one is a clamped fence. And you can see the image over there. That's, the, that's one way how you can set it up. And if you, want, if you look at the, the image, um, it looks like they're putting some housings in, maybe for a, a bookcase or something like that. Um, so ensure the fence extends at least 100 millimeters before and after the wood being cut so the router is straight and, and supported when it enters and exits the cut. Make sure the fence is low enough and wide enough to clear the clamps and also you want to clear the handles on the router as well. Now, if the router is to be pushed away from the user, so that's from the bottom of the screen towards the top, the fence should be clamped to the left as pictured. However, and I include myself in this, um, some users prefer to pull the router towards them, and I prefer to do it because I feel as though I have better control over it, um, in which case the fence should be on the left-hand side. And again, that relates to the direction of the um, the cutter, the way it rotates and which way it wishes to push in the timber. 
So the second way is the fence attached to the router. So here's, I mean, the image really tells you everything you need to know. Um, again, you do have to think carefully about the feed direction. Because it's now attached to the router, it's going to be on the opposite side. So in this case, the router, if, if we're going from the bottom of the screen towards the top, the router is going to want to push towards, out towards the right hand side. So you need to have the clamp, the clamp or the fence sitting out on the left hand side to stop the router from being able to wander off um, to the right. Now, this is just a practical tip for school. Note carefully, the fence is locked in place with two wing nuts and you can see them in the image and it's true for every router. These are easy to lose in the school workshop. Create a system to ensure they do not go missing because usually they're a unique um, fitting and if you lose them, you just can't replace them that easily. Okay, the third way is a pilot tipped bearing. And if you look at the image there, that's what we've got. There's a bearing on the end and the cutter's sitting above it. That's called a flush trim bit. It's a very useful bit. So it allows cuts such as decorative edging, rebating, um, and flush trimming to be achieved because of a bearing located at the tip of the cutter. The bearing can be of various sizes, particularly if you're doing rebating, the size of the bearing uh, can be important. And, it depend and that depends on the effect that you're requiring. The bearing rests on the timber and runs along it. Now, one thing to just note um, from your own sort of perspective, but also with students in the school, get the students always to do a dry run with it if there is a bearing involved, because um, number one, you don't want the bearing or the tip of the bearing um, banging into the bench top. But the other thing too is, um, you know, somewhere along the, the cut, they might find that the bearing bangs into the vise or something else. So you just get them to do a practice run first and make sure that the bearing only runs along the timber and there's nothing else getting in the way of it. If the project requires routing a corner, approach it very slowly, but follow through on each side rather than rolling the router around the corner, as the router is unsupported and prone to tilting. Before starting a cut, pretty much what I said there before, check bearing is adjusted so that it wholly rests against the timber, doesn't hit anything, doesn't hit the tabletop, you know, all that sort of thing. And also that it's in good condition and running smoothly when spun by hand. Again, you would do this when the router is not plugged in, but yeah, just check to see if the bearing is uh, running smoothly. Always travel in an anti-clockwise direction when routing around the outside of an object, such as a panel or board. Always travel in a clockwise direction if routing around an internal panel, for example, cutting a rebate for a glass insert. That's just to reinforce what I said earlier. Okay, so another one is a template chaser known as a guide bush. Um, so it's used when shapes, generally of a curved nature, are being reproduced. The system uses a guiding device and it's actually attached underneath the router. It's not shown in this picture. Um, that does not allow the cutter bit to wander off in any direction other than that which is required. So the guide bush is attached underneath and it just follows that template. The template is designed so that the guide bush fits perfectly and cannot wander off from side to side. The template must be firmly clamped to the workpiece for obvious reasons. Okay, so the final one is freehand routing. And that's, it's used to route out an area of wood to a certain depth. So if you've got a, you know, there might be a, uh, a large area of wood or you're doing a, a um, you know, fitting something into a housing, but it's, it's, you know, quite a large area, you would use some freehand routing just basically to get rid of the waste material. You would still use some sort of template to make sure that the edge of that was exactly how you wanted it to be. Um, that would be almost impossible to do uh, by hand. 
So you use it for inlay work, relief or recessed work. And if you're routing out an area larger than the router base plate, always start in the middle and work outwards. And finally there, routers are often used with jigs for a variety of tasks, such as cutting dovetails with specialist cutters. And I've, I've shown a, a lee jig there, which is one that's used for cutting dovetails, and you can see an example of that there. Now factors that affect cutting are how fast the router is being fed into the material is one, the depth of the cut, the size of the bit and also its sharpness, the moisture content and the hardness of the wood that you're cutting. And I think, I mean, after a while, it's just through experience. You listen to the sound of the cutter and you'll become very attuned to it in your workshop. The sound that the router makes will give you a good indication of whether the feed speed should be increased or decreased or if multiple cuts are required. So for example, if the person using the router is trying to cut too much off at once. Feeding too slow may burn the timber, whereas feeding too fast will leave it rough or may cause it to, to chip. Now there's types, different types of router bits. And to be honest, there are like literally thousands of different types of router bits because they're so useful. So we'll just break it down into some really basic classifications. And of course, in the school context, you, you tend to be using um, a smaller number of router bits, but you're using them quite frequently. So you're using straight cutters and they're used for trenches, grooves, rebates and tenons. Um, there's edge profiles and they are normally pilot tipped. So they've normally got the uh, bearing on the end. And there's many shapes available, such as a cove, uh, and you can actually see an image of a cove there, and ovolo, um, which is an interesting shape, a Roman OG, which is similar to the classical um, bit shown there, um, and beading bits as well. Other pilot tip um, types such as rebate and flush trim. Um, we've talked a little bit about flush trim and you can see a flush trim bit there. Um, and then you get these specialist bits like cabinet door sets with it matching interchangeable parts for door frames and panels. A little bit similar to the tongue and groove bit that you can see um, up the top there. There's other specialist non-pilot types such as V bits, rounded bits and finger jointing bits. So you can see I've just given some other images there as well, just so you can see what, what they look like. So I've got a round over, they're pretty common. So if you want to get a nice sort of rounded over edge on something, an OG, and there's classical OGs and Roman OGs, um, that's more of your traditional kind of um, profile. You've got your straight bit there, which uh, like I said, is really good for cutting um, the long shoulders on tenons, uh, through housing joints, you know, all those sorts of things, rebates as well. And then you've got your flush trim bit. They're particularly useful if you can make up a template and then have um, the bearing follow the template and then the bit will, will um, cut the timber the way you want it to be cut. Very good for delicate curves and things like that. Okay, and pardon the pun, tips for use. So when you start a router, make sure you are in a well-balanced position and are holding the router firmly because the initial torque will twist the router. The other thing too that is not mentioned there is when you start the router, make sure the cutter is not in contact with the timber. So you, you do want to rest it on the job, but just have it away from the timber because if you start it, um, it will grab the timber and it will tear the timber. Now before plugging in and using the router, familiarise yourself with the grip and practice switching it on and off to get the feel for it. Do a practice cut on scrap if you are unsure of how a cut will look or how the router will, be, will behave. So particularly if you're new to it um, or the, the cut or the procedure that you're going to do is one that you haven't done before. Always clamp the workpiece 
and wherever possible with at least two clamps. When exiting an edge, scrap timber should be clamped at the same height to, to support the timber as the cutter passes through. So for example, if you're doing a housing joint from all the way through from one side of a board to the other, as you bring it um, out, if that is not supported on the way out, you'll tend to get a chip um, on the side where the cutter comes out. So just clamp a bit of scrap timber there um, and it will protect, it'll stop your job from getting a chip and the scrap timber will get the chip instead. Ensure that the bit is clear of the wood before starting the router. So I did mention that. When routing along an edge, and that, that's pretty much what you can see in this image here, half the router weight is hanging out unsupported. So apply more downward pressure on the side that is supported by the wood. When you have finished making a pass, if the bit is still within the wood, so for example, if you're doing a stopped housing joint, um, so that's a housing joint that doesn't go all the way through, it just stops somewhere in the timber. Move it back about two millimeters and keep it perfectly still until the bit has stopped before lifting it out of the wood. Okay, now if you try to lift it out, you will probably move it slightly to one side and it will grab the timber and damage it. Whenever possible, use power sockets suspended from the ceiling to avoid trailing extension leads. And in any case, be very, very aware of where extension leads are or where the leads go. Um, that's why I do tend to always do a, a dry run cut where the machine isn't even turned on because I just want to see where the, where the lead goes. You don't want the lead wrapping down and getting underneath the router and uh, coming into contact with the cutter. 